Yeah, so this, uh, this initiative is important uh, for the continent. It also provides a nice counterpoint to the protectionism that is arising in different uh, uh, parts of the world. It's definitely needed uh, because uh, Africa is fragmented and uh, trade within Africa is a very small part of, uh, of the total trade of Africa. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to imagine that Africa can break out onto uh, world manufacturing markets um, and become competitive uh, in a lot of internationalized industries uh, which are essential for its development unless it has a critical mass uh, of a market that, that it addresses. And as the Economic Commission for Africa has pointed out, uh, not only uh, uh, the trade that is within Africa at the moment tends to be trade in manufactured products or agricultural products, uh, and the trade that is outside of Africa uh, tends to be of um, uh, what they call extractables, uh, so natural resources. And that is a promising sign that if you could get more integration within Africa, um, you could develop uh, more of agriculture and industry within Africa. It is quite surprising uh, as an economist when I approach this issue uh, for the first time about uh, nine months ago to see how many barriers there are within Africa. Uh, so it's ironic that Africa, African countries have very high tariffs with each other in relative terms, but they actually trade quite freely with the European Union and with the United States. So there's a kind of trade diversion that is occurring, which is orienting in an artificial way uh, trade outside of Africa instead of inside, uh, inside of uh, Africa. Um, one other point I would make is that uh, we must not make the error in Africa that we made when we did the uh, Middle East North Africa agreements with the European Union, which is to assume that because you do the free trade agreement, automatically you're going to solve a lot of problems and get a lot of growth etc etc so long experience and many studies have shown that in the language of economists there is no unconditional convergence it isn't just because you open trade that you converge to the higher income of your partners whatever that might be um, convergence international trade liberalization only works in conjunction with strengthening of domestic policies. If you don't have the strengthening of domestic policies, frankly, you can do all the trade liberalization that you want. If you don't have the political stability, if you don't have peace, in a lot of places in Africa there isn't peace, and if you don't have a reasonable predictability of the business climate, I'm talking about corruption, I'm talking about governance, etc., etc. you are very unlikely to get investment in that kind of context where the trade is open or not. In fact, sometimes I have made the argument that if you don't have those domestic conditions, trade can actually hurt you because all that happens is you get a lot of imports, but you don't get the export response. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of the agreement itself, that's the general point. In terms of the agreement itself, what are the conditions for its success? The first, again, I stress, is improvement in domestic policies and governance. That's the first condition for the success of the African continental free trade area, and it's a very important thing that should happen irrespective of the African continental free trade area. That I take as given. The technicalities of the agreement, there are three points uh, that uh, need to be 
uh, need to be recognized. Number one, uh, the agreement has to be inclusive. Right now, I would, I would argue it is pretty inclusive. I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 45 or 46 uh, countries have uh, now signed on to the agreement, except for the elephant in the room so far, and that's Nigeria. Now, a few months ago, the president of Nigeria made a statement, I think it was in Ouagadougou, that he was going to sign the agreement. The agreement, as far as I know, has not been signed. I just checked this morning. And there's a lot of debate within Nigeria about signing it. So it's very important that Nigeria signs it. I want to say a word about Nigeria, why it's such a complicated. Of course, it's the biggest economy in Africa. So without Nigeria, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, difficult to see how this thing functions as an, as an African agreement. But Nigeria, the, the, the political economy in Nigeria is extremely complicated. It's an oil exporter. And, uh, uh, but it has a domestic uh, manufacturing and agricultural output, of course, uh, which is uncompetitive in part because of the oil exports and the Dutch disease effects. But Nigeria, as I like to stress, is not Saudi Arabia. Nigeria is, uh, is uh, the oil res resources of Nigeria relative to the population of Nigeria, which is 200 million people. Is, is tiny, okay? Uh, so Nigeria cannot be like the Gulf states thinking it's going to, you know, just take its time to develop uh, using oil resources. It has to diversify its economy and it has to diversify its economy now. So it's very important for Nigeria, not to mention all the geopolitical considerations of it being, if it wants to be a leader in the continent, it has to be part of this, of this agreement. So that's a first condition, is Nigeria has to join. The second, uh, the uh, second and third conditions are quite technical. Uh, the second condition is the agreement says we will liberalize 90% of trade. But they don't specify what that means. If it's 90% of trade, actual trade volumes, etc., that's not too bad. But if it's 90% of tariff lines, then countries can play a lot of games in choosing the appropriate tariff lines under which they're not going uh, to liberalize and essentially negate the effects of the agreement. Okay? And the third point, the third technical point, is that um, uh, rules of origin are very important in free trade agreements. So for those of you who have not had the pleasure of uh, studying rules of origin, it's basically, if a product comes in from Ghana into Kenya, is it really a product from Ghana or is it a product from China? Okay? And so you need rules of origin in order to make sure that the free trade agreement is not abused, so to speak. Okay? But these rules of origin, if they're made to be very complicated, you know, uh, specific to particular products, depending on the production uh, process, or uh, how many times it's been transformed, etc., it can become very, very difficult for people to comply with the rules of origin. And so it's important that the rule of origin be simple especially in an African context where you have a lot of governance issues. And so something like a value-added uh, value criteria, you know, like 50% of value-added has to be within Africa, and there's accumulation wherever it is produced in Africa. I think that's an important third condition. Uh, finally, I just want to say uh, the other big issue, which is impossible uh, to separate from trade policy is uh, the infrastructure uh, question. So, you, you know, anybody who's familiar with Africa knows that it is a gigantic continent. Uh, the distance between Casablanca and Johannesburg is 8,000 kilometers, which is about the distance between Brussels and Beijing. But this is a continent that is very poor in all of its transportation infrastructure, whether you're talking about roads, ports, airports, uh, it's very weak uh, in that regard. Uh, so uh, the African continental free trade area in order to work has to be accompanied by a stepped up effort of all concerned, and 
that means includes the Chinese, doesn't just include the Europeans or the Americans, uh, because the Chinese are very good at infrastructure. Uh, uh, it has to be accompanied by a major effort uh, to scale up the infrastructure, particularly in the area of transportation. Okay, thank you very much for this very complete presentation. Listening to you, I have the impression that there are more obstacles yet to jump over because before we, give, we can begin to implement the agreement, especially coming from Nigeria, because if we listen to you, Nigeria still has to tidy up its domestic economy before being able to join. So it's not very encouraging as a view, but we'll, we'll come back to that.